I'm Jay Sullivan, professor of sculpture at SMU, and this is Kanishka Raja, who is a graduate um, with an MFA from Southern Methodist University, we think, maybe in about 1995. I think that's um, right. And uh, I think what's notable is that really immediately after that, now you, Kanishka is a, um, what do I want to say, a binational artist, uh, grew up in India, studied in the United States, mm -hmm. and, but you've, since that time, you, you went to New York, but you also spent some time in India. I did. I spent about, not, a, I mean, I've, I, it's a very fluid relationship, my relationship with mm -hmm. India, because my family still lives there, so I'm there all the time, and right. it doesn't really feel like you know, that was separated from this. But I went and lived you know, specifically in India for about a year and a half after I finished. Mm -hmm. But then, since then, I've maintained a very regular sort of back and forth trajectory. Well, it also seems that you've, um, it seems as though you've maintained, um, I mean, you exhibit both in India and the United States as well as in Europe, but it seems as though you've, you've maintained that, that, shall we say, that international exhibition, or at least exhibition in uh, South Asia um, as almost a, a kind of ethical commitment to being an artist in both places. Yeah, that sounds loftier than perhaps my intentionality is, um, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> I think generally speaking my intention is to try and you know show the work, well first of all obviously in, in any um, kind of, you know, right venue, and as many mm -hmm. venues as possible, but also because a lot of the work of what I do is very much grounded in that duality to be able yeah. to try and show it in both places, and, you know. Some of it is outside my control, but I take the opportunities when they come. But when you left here, <clears throat> I know you, you had engaged various, um, let's call them Indic motifs, you're right. very interested in um, in the patterning of um, architecture of, mm -hmm. of of textiles and things, but at that point you were essentially an abstract artist, right? And and that was really your the focus of most of your training. I mean, working with Denzel Hurley, and yep. then you were here. So I'm interested in in the shift that you have made to something which is um, still staying within painting involves, obviously, as all painting does, um, complex abstraction, but now is much more explicitly in areas of narrative um, and imagery, Image. which attempts to, um, to show us things that only images can show. That, I think, was a, a critical shift for me, and it took a while, mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly, Immediately after I finished graduate school, if you had asked me if that's what direction I was inclined to go in, I would have not really agreed or necessarily seen mm -hmm. that coming. But it took about, I think, you know, in, in the way that graduate school tends to sort of compress a lot of ideas into a very short, specific period of time, it takes a while to some, you know, at least for me, it took a while to kind of unpack that material. And so I see it as a just sort of a, a very um, natural or a very organic evolution mm -hmm. um, of a process wherein I just started thinking deeper and deeper about what it was that was driving my interests and yeah. where my focus lay. And at a certain point, I think I just realized that I wanted to make images, that, that images were really the, the impetus that drove me to want to become an artist to begin mm -hmm. with, yeah. and specifically representational images and also photographic images and all of the attendant conventions and complexities. Um, that became very clear at a certain point, and it, you know, it did feel like, okay, this is something clearly I've been working towards, but now I've realized and I can articulate for myself. So it felt fairly, you know, it didn't feel 
you know, wrong in any way. Right. It just felt like a natural uh, growth. And well, one day I just found out that, oh, I was prepared to do this. Whereas three years or four years before, while I was in graduate school, for example, I just didn't entertain the possibility at all. Yeah. Well, it, it also seems that, um, I mean, fairly recently um, in other discussions, you've talked about um, your lack of interest in what's the con conventional Western conveyance of images, which is some type of Renaissance type space. And you're much more interested, at least in Western traditions, in a pre-Renaissance, kind of late medieval right. um, space, which is able to articulate um, within one surface um, a relatively heterogeneous set of sensations. Was there something in particular about that that also made you know the development of imagery more accessible? You know that 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 you found very much an alternative which you felt very comfortable in to, shall we say, the traditional presentation of images through a quote window or a or a frame as window. Uh, yeah, that's complicated. Uh, I suppose I suppose what I again was probably not would not have been able to articulate while I was searching for it, but can in hindsight. I was looking in some ways always to find as many different alternate modes, kind of pictorial mm -hmm. modes, to <coughs> the, the kind of canon, the canonical yeah. mode, so to speak. And to find correlations, I think it, it clicked in most specifically for me when I started to see sort of in some ways a structural correlation between video game images uh -huh. that I look at, looked at at least at the time fairly extensively, and medieval pictures, mm -hmm. you know, like medieval paintings from Siena or something. Yeah. Um, and it did imply the same kind of heterogeneity that you're talking about, or a kind of, at least a simultaneity, <clears throat> you know, and a compression, all of which relates to also you know, comic books, and miniature paintings. And, and you're, you're also and, interested and, in uh, early, well, kind of mid 20th century cinema. And right, which all of these things somehow started to coalesce in a, in a way that then I think essentially mm -hmm. has become what I do. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's where that connection started to happen to see that there is a ways in which I can connect, you know, yeah. 14th century painting in Central Italy to video games to all of these other things uh -huh. we're talking about, um, and to this day they remain kind of important touchstones. All of those things. This is really a kind of abridged version of the talk I'm right. going to say on but, Friday, uh, anyway. Well, but <laughs> now so you know I, all so the I secrets. So I can get it, you know, because <laughs> right. I'm, I'm going to skip town before then, oh, right. or just right after that, which I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other things that interested me over the last few years. You did a series of paintings, um, I think it was, what, for the show, I've Seen the Enemy and It Is I, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I being E-Y-E, -E, which suggests a slight distrust of um, maybe the visual vision. world yeah. of vision. But um, those paintings very specifically kind of took up this, um, this well, as uh, Foucault would call it, this heterotopia kind of of the airport, this, this strange... Right. Um, geography that that exists in every major city in the world that doesn't exist really in that city it's its own kind of big world city and it, what struck me about those paintings um, as versus the the last large show is um, those felt very compressed those felt as though the space um, was like the airport like the airplane was contained Mm -hmm. Whereas the new paintings seem to be much more explosive, have these long horizontal passages, you know, roads that move in and out, right. um, and even the paint seems to have that same speed. Right. So I'm kind of interested in this, um, you know, more tightly compacted image um, of something which is nevertheless a, a network of of airplanes and people, 
and then this this other image, which is um, which is faster, slipperier, um, more to or fro, harder to get a foot foothold. Footing. Yeah. In. You're interested in why there's a change? Yeah. I, I, right. Whether or not, I, I mean, there's always change, but I, whether or not there was any kind of conscious conscious move. I think that what you're picking up on is very, very accurate. Um, and I think what happened in those around the time or, or towards the end of the Eye of Seen, The Enemy and In His Eye show, um, that way of working started to feel exactly that, too compressed and mm -hmm. too contained. And while it seemed like um, the right way to think about that particular you know, network and that particular liminality that the airport implies yeah. and all of that attendant stuff. Um, I think by the time I got to the end of that show, I felt like I had sort of, I needed to open the door <laughs> yeah. and leave. Um, A little bit like when you open the door from the airport and you say, right. okay, where right. am I? <laughs> and so quite literally, I, yeah. that's what happened. And the work has evolved much more drastically in both yeah. in form and in also in its imagery mm -hmm. since and in fact I haven't really made any paintings that involve or think about even the airport space yeah. um, and that it's interesting because that just sort of letting go or relinquishing that content in a way I think allowed relinquishing a way of making the work so the, the paintings are slipperier because the the place that they're located in now is more slippery as well, uh -huh. um, which seems right, so, um, more right anyway. Yeah, the, um, I'll, I'll globally call them the airport paintings, sorry. Um, but those also, they invoke figurative imagery through very, very specific things. And yeah. they're, they're kind of uh, almost refugee camps or stopover camps within the airports and so you have lots of this detritus of, of habitation um, a kind of enforced right. temporary habitation you still use that as an image although it's a little different you've always liked this uh, I'm going to call it almost like the bedroom set domestic <laughs> image um, beds have figured strongly uh -huh. in your painting and they do in this so in that um, it's uh, it's um, uh, KR what nine or something the, the large building sure yeah, that, yeah. and that then knife there's edge a building right. and then down at the bottom there there's, are there's like furniture five sets of yeah. <laughs> bedroom furniture <laughs> for some strange reason um, <clears throat> talk about how you know this notion of habitation um, or or maybe the habitation of resting you know this idea that you have what I don't know a, a bed to lie in against this much more amorphous kind of megalopolis that you have. I suppose I... Well, it's hard to encapsulate, but I will say that some of it at least is driven by thinking about, looking at, in, in conjunction with, you know, what the implication of the airport space is and its liminality, etc. Um, thinking about migration. Mm -hmm. yeah thinking about journeys and movement and, and all of those kinds of um, phenomena, um, the bed just becomes a, a very convenient, just like the airport was, is a very convenient repository for the ideas, the bed becomes a very convenient yeah. repository for ideas about place or about, you know, grounding or lack thereof or, you know, yeah. and, and so, that's all it is, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have any particular you know, okay. fascination with beds or bedrooms from a furniture maker point of view. Mm -hmm. But just um, to take a slightly different tack, um, how do you feel as a painter painting? Uh, I feel great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, painting is a is a is a whipping boy for all sorts of things in the art world. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> it's a it's a combination of. 
I think I was much more in crisis about it, let's say, seven, eight, nine years ago. I, I felt more consciously aware of the fact that I was doing something that in many contexts is seen as, as a kind of retrograde kind of move. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, as a sort of, <clears throat> partly because I've done it for longer and have become more aware of the inherent complexities within it, but partly also because I've kind of come to um, a realization, I suppose, that A, I'm interested in images mm -hmm. and making images and thinking about images, and B, that I am specifically, or the kinds of images I'm specifically interested in making are best really served by painting because painting has a way of sort of living in the continuous present that I don't find possible in many other ways of making images. Now, so that's interesting because that I mean it suggests that you, for example, I mean, because most of many artists would say, well, yes, I'm interested in images, so they might move more towards photography or right. video or something. And I know you've said that you have an interest in not just narrative, but also documentation, but sure. that's a different documentation. Yeah. There seems to be something, perhaps, that you're suggesting about those ways of making images that almost is a bit more, um, you're always const uh, constantly aware that it was made at a certain point and it's getting older. Yeah, photography... Where painting doesn't seem... No, photography is always sense. about death, yeah. right? At some fundamental it level... It starts and then it's going. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it, yeah. it involves death and, and I think painting somehow can bypass that. It doesn't have to. It mm -hmm. can also be about death, <laughs> I'm sure. A lot of paintings <laughs> about death. <isn't> yeah. <laughs> but so I find it kind of much more interesting to, to kind of, because also because it stands outside of the dominant pictorial production method right. of our time. You know, Which it, makes it kind of nice. And it's, that's <laughs> why it can become, that can actually be more, you know, s s I think, function as a more critical, or have a more critical function. You know, because, it, and this is a, and we could be here all night, <laughs> and many people could argue against me, but it seems to me that the photographic, because it's already embedded inside of, of, this giant apparatus of, by which we make images and read images mm -hmm. um, <coughs> is inherently compromised as well. And so always has to confront its production, whereas painting doesn't have to do that. You know, painting has to, you yeah. know, painting has to contend with all, a bunch of other stuff, you know, its history. It is interesting. Politics, you know, but it, I do a lot of work now digitally as well as sure. just in the studio, but there are some problems that you I, I can get to in a digital program, and it just takes it would take me forever to work through it. Right. And I could just do it. Go in and minutes. Pick right. up X and say, this is how we're going to take care of it. And it um, it deals with the complexity in a funny sense, and I think this is true about painting as well. It can deal with very very complex surfaces, very very complex systems of images, in a in a. I don't know. Maybe it's not so much in a faster way, but in a more, in a more open, more comfortable way. You can get, you can sure. get more in, almost. Mm -hmm. And in, and in part because it doesn't have. I mean, the rule system is very different. Right. And uh, and that's good. You know, we're doing a paid political announcement here, so I should <laughs> ask. I should ask the question. Um, did we help you at all? Because <laughs> you've been very successful. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would say so. Um, again, like I alluded to earlier, it, it, it's a, it's in the long sort of no. term that I find the experience most helpful.